Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Amid concerns raised by its officials and their families over reopening of all roads in cantonment areas to civilians, the army has said any final decision on opening or closing of roads will be taken after receiving feedback from local military authorities. In a statement, the army said that the opening of cantonment roads is a deliberate calibrated and monitored exercise aimed at streamlining the process of closure where required after carrying out assessment of the nature of traffic moving through cantonments by following due procedure. According to a decision taken during a meeting convened by Defence Minister Nirmala Sitaraman recently, it was decided that all closed roads in cantonment areas will be reopened immediately. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse if cantonment roads should be opened to the public or not. Joining me on the programme today are... Major General Ravi Arora, Chief Editor, Indian Military Review. Also joining us is Professor Amita Paliwal, wife of an army officer, and Pankaj Sethi, Member, Federation of Northeastern Colonies of Sikandrabad. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Professor, I'd like to begin the show with you because the Army Wives Association has been vehemently against this particular move of opening the cantonment roads to the general public. Why is that so? Um, see, the, um, there are many points. The first point is the safety and security of the families, those who are living in the SF quarters especially. SF, to tell you, is the separate family accommodations. When the officers are posted at the border or in the insurgency areas, then their families are provided accommodation inside the cantonment. Now, uh, our, um, we are against it because um, uh, first is the breach of security. Um, when our husbands are posted in the, um, uh, in the, in the border areas, uh, there is a sense of security in their mind for their families that they are living in the cantonment so they are safe because sometimes they are not able to uh, approach their families for three months, four months, six months or even seven months. They are not able to meet. So who take care of the families? It is the... Uh, military and um, it's the cantonment facilities which provides them a sense of security so when you know it is open for the public then there are no we do not have very high uh, tech security cameras inside our accommodations we don't have those video cameras who will record of coming and going of the you know um, of the people so uh, our safety and security is also at stake okay sure. secondly in the name of public we are not against public you know because in the cantonment i think 50% of the civil population al already comes and goes we have civil um, um, shops inside the um, inside the cantonment we do have contractors coming inside the cantonment we do have taxi wallas coming inside the cantonment and all those and also the laborers and workers coming inside the cantonment areas the only thing is that there can be anti um, you know national element or any person who can come in the garb of a civilian inside the cantonment and what we should not forget is the recent attack on Kaluchak, Pathan Court, Sajwan where there was so much of tight security and despite that the attack take place. Now if the attack take place on the families or on the you know on the quarters or even the um, uh, offices inside the cantonment who will take the liabilities mm. the public mm. Mm. an interesting point there raised uh, by the professor major general you know the fact that the cantonment area does not have you know modern day technology is something that she raised and that's an issue that i want to take up with you why isn't it that we have that kind of technology especially in cantonment areas rather than stopping the general public Shouldn't we concentrate on enhancing the security within the cantonment areas? Uh, surely. But you know, in the public mind, the perception is cantonments are army areas, they are secure, they are safe. They are not. Hmm. The cantonment areas are occupied by installations, by living quarters, by defense personnel, by units, by uh, such other things. Many of them are on training most of the time. Uh, there are these areas are under the local commander for their security and safety but if you were to protect them against all kinds of threats everybody in the cantonment would be occupied in doing that rather than their primary job in peace stations which is training for war hmm. so no, uh, you, you know I just, I'm sorry to cut you short but you spoke about how there's a perception that people feel that the cantonment areas are safe. Aren't they safe? Because I grew up in a cantonment area. 
and my parents would feel extremely safe when I, when I was a child if I would tell them that I would be going into a containment area. So the general public also probably feels that way, that no, it's a safer environment. No, what I meant was that if all containments are opened up for thorough tra through traffic for everybody, that they would remain safe because it is an army area, because everywhere there are army men. Well, they're not armed all the time. Hmm. And you cannot, you're not checking everybody all the time. You know, the best security are the people, the, the armed forces personnel in the cantonment. But if they are watching out for their own safety all the time, when are they going to do their primary function? Hmm. The second is, I agree that uh, for the civilians living around the cantonment, uh, it's an inconvenience that they can't pass through all the roads. Yeah. But uh, again, a two, there is a, a fallacy. Two a two kilometer distance can yeah. be 10 kilometers. Again, there is a fallacy. A large number of cantonments, a, a, a large number of roads have always been open. Hmm. There are certain roads in cantonment areas which are closed because they pass through such installations or units where even passers by can get a glimpse of the equipment inside, the guns and tanks in their garages inside to get an idea who is there in what quantities and whether they are in station or not. Sure. So I think this security is a local subject for the local commander to manage, not micromanaged from the Ministry of Defense or the Army headquarters. Rather than opening up all the roads, it would have been better to open up some of the essential roads which perhaps over time the public could use. But security is one aspect which nowadays has become paramount. Remember there was a time when you could drive through Parliament House from the main entrance of yes. Parliament House. Parliament House road is closed. Right. Why is it closed? Because there is a threat perception. Sure. An attack has already taken place. At one time you could drive to the Parliament canteen, park your motorbike outside the canteen, have a bite and go away. No longer so. Okay, times have changed and so we times need to adapt changed. is what Security you're suggesting. Security requirements okay. have uh, become more, much more important. There is a need to use common sense. Okay, there's a need to use common sense. That's the idea. Okay, with that point being made, let's take the discussion forward. But first, let me introduce on the program now Vivek Anand Nair, Head Urban Governance Studies, Janagraha. Welcome. Uh, let me go across to Pankaj Sethi now, who's... Uh, going to talk to us about the other side of the debate. You know, his organization has been petitioning against opening up of uh, containment roads for a while now. Pankaj Sethi, why do you believe that the uh, containment roads should be opened up for the general public to use? Frank, thank you for having me on the show. And I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Honorable Raksha Mantri and the Chief of Army Staff for listening to the pleas of, uh, you know, crores of civilians who are affected by road closure. Now, I'm not making that figure lightly. I'm not stating that figure of crores of civilians lightly. Cantonments today are surrounded by civil areas. The roads through the cantonments are uh, lifelines. They are arteries that connect civilian areas to each other. And uh, closure of these roads obviously causes uh, untold misery, extra costs, pollutions, uh, time delays, because uh, Today, most cantonments are located in thickly populated areas. They're surrounded by thickly populated areas, civilian areas. Now, coming to the point of why we are and on what basis we are asking for roads to be opened, one point that I wanted to make clear is that although the technical word you have used is petitioning, mm -hmm. frankly, what we have been demanding is our rights. Now, what gives us our rights to commute on these roads? The single most important fact that uh, seems to be missing in the discussion is that uh, cantonments, unlike pure military bases, are a mix of civilian and military population by definition. And uh, all cantonments in India, all 62 of them, are governed by the provisions of the Cantonment Act, which is basically a municipal act. And amongst the clauses and sections in the municipal act are stipulations regarding roads. And the provisions which are there in the Cantonments Act of 2006 clearly state that public have a right of way on the streets inside a cantonment. This is not something which is, uh, you know, a, a demand or a begging a kind of a, you know, please give us our, uh, you know, because we have to spend more time and all that. This is part of the law. Now, in fact, this was recognized even by colonial British rulers who uh, originally framed these rules. I mean, the Cantonment Land, Ad Land Administration rules were originally framed in 1937. 
And today, these provisions are even more relevant because we are a free democracy. Now, the law clearly states that local military authorities have no statutory power to close these streets. Only the municipality concerned, which is basically the cantonment board, may close roads, and that too after following a specified procedure. However, it is a fact that uh, local military authorities have been closing roads, and today there are more than 200, 250 roads in 62 cantonments which are closed. Right. Against the rules. Sure. Okay, point taken. In let, let, let me see what the other panelists have to say now. You know, Professor has been uh, raising her hand now for some time. She wants yeah. to come in on the debate. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, my first point is that there are two different aspects. One mm. is safety, one is uh, your convenience, right? So for your convenience, you want to use the cantonment roads. What about the safety of the people who are living inside the cantonment? What about the safety of the officers and the families who are living inside the cantonment? When you talk about conveniences, what, why don't you ever think about the army people who are serving in a minus 40 degrees? And then they have this at the back of their mind that their families are safe in the cantonment. Why don't you think of the conveniences when the army has to travel you know, on the inconvenient roads? For eight hours, seven hours, ten hours, then you don't demand that the road should be made good for the army. And the um, army people should be more, when they travel in the public transport like um, train, buses and all, then you don't demand when they are sleeping near the toilets. Then you don't demand then the, you know, conveniences should be given to the army. Why you need all those roads? Okay, the roads which are linking to the broader roads should be linked. But do you guarantee the inner roads? Do you give the guarantee of the inner roads which are leaving to the accommodations, which are leaving to the uh, canteen, which are leaving to the uh, office areas? Recently when they opened, for three days it was opened. The accidents took place. The three girls were molested inside the cantonment. And then they were, um, you know, the, the high speeding car, it just, it just toppled over in, in, inside the cantonment. It could hit, hurt anyone. The officers moving, the jawans, um, you know, stationed there uh, on their duty. So, who would have been accountable for their life and the danger which it can uh, lead open to? I, we are not against the public. See, army is guarding the border for the nation and for the public so that they can sleep in their houses. Um, you know, they can have sound sleep in their houses. But just because they want four kilometers or five kilometers to be open for their conveniences, why don't they talk about other conveniences for the army and their family? Can't they compromise for their five hours for the families of those who are sacrificing six, seven, eight or the entire youth on the border for the safety you know, of these that's civilians? A, that, that's an argument to uh, which, which... And we, that's which, a very valid argument. Yeah, it's a very valid argument. Yes. It's an argument to... It's a difficult argument to argue with uh, yeah. at this point in time. But let me bring in um, yeah. uh, Vivek Anandan Nair into the picture now. You know, Vivek, as far as this particular issue is concerned, public convenience versus security, how do we deal with this problem? Do we improve the infrastructure within the entire city itself? Or what's the way forward, really? Uh, I'm glad you raised that point because I think that's central to the argument. What we are seeing here in terms of restricting access to certain areas or not is, is essentially right now about thoroughfare, hmm. being able to go from A to B. But if you, if you uh, stay, uh, let's say, at a 30,000 feet level, you could say that this is an argument about mobility of citizens in an area which is called a city. Now, for an average citizen, they're not going to look at an area saying that this is a cantonment board, this is municipality A, this is Gram Panchayat B. They are not so worried about how the administrative boundaries are defined. They are worried about getting from A to B, having certain quality of life indicators met, which includes commute time. And commute time is linked, uh, as the gentleman before uh, me uh, said, to air pollution, to a lot of productivity issues around cities. Now, now I am trying to give it a different perspective here, right? That this is an issue of how you look at cities as a whole and how you govern them as a whole. When it comes to cantonment boards, I'm I'm sure uh, your other esteemed panelists are well placed to answer whether it's a security versus convenience question but I'm going to pose the question of uh, how do you best manage the cantonment board resources to ensure that the city which is essentially now has enveloped many cantonments throughout India to make sure that the let's say mobility is seamless or other uh, even utilities are seamless right in a lot of cases utilities also pass near cantonment boards now there have been issues in the past with cantonment boards have not been able to provide, uh, let's say, access to them so that roads can pass through or maybe other arterial utilities can pass through. So how do you see the utilization of cantonment resources is, is to me the centrality because essentially today it's about A. Tomorrow it could become about utilization of land. And 
let me put just one point across to give you perspective of what I'm talking about. It's again a larger point, not specific to the security. Which is in 2013, the, I think the Parliamentary Committee on Defence Estates Management uh, came out and said that the cantonment boards in India have bought excess land, which is land they do not perhaps need to have, of about 86,000 acres. Now that's roughly the size of Surat city, mm. which holds about 4 million population. Now how do you then leverage the excess land that exists in cantonments to then make sure that the city and cantonments are seamless in terms of also mobility? Now, those are some of the aspects that I think we'll also need to consider in the future. Uh, this may just be a starting point about citizens wanting to engage more constructively with cantonment boards and municipalities. You know, th that's a very valid point that he has made, you know, uh, General, as far as uh, uh, the local military authorities itself are concerned. Do you believe that they should have spoken to the stakeholders concerned, maybe come up with, with, with a joint decision on how they could come out? Come, out, come about with a workaround and try and deal with this problem at their level rather than take it to this particular level? No, there is an institutional mechanism for this. Very regularly in every military station, at, at the state level, civil military liaison conferences are held where uh, generally these kind of problems are projected and they are discussed. In, and in those liaison conferences, both the civil administration and the military uh, authorities are present uh, wherever there are uh, cantonment board issues on the agenda those people are also present so yes there is a problem these requests have been coming in these requests have always been considered some decisions have been taken some roads have been opened you can see in Delhi itself through cantonment there are many roads which are open all the time there are many roads on which there are some security checks and there are some where there are strict security checks before anybody is allowed in because they are leading to certain areas, as the professor has pointed out, where there are either separated families living there or there is sensitive equipment or a sensitive installation. Remember in cantonments there are these installations where sabotage has been carried out and now with the, the militants under great pressure and suffering a lot of casualties, they are looking for soft targets. Cantonments are soft targets. They are in peace stations. Uh, unlike field areas where there is very strict security, nobody approaches. Here where there is through traffic uh, on many roads, people will carry out reconnaissance of soft targets. They were going to plan attacks and these attacks have taken place as pointed out in Kaluchak, in Samba, in Sanjuwan, in Nagrota, in Pathankot, in many places where a large number of families have been killed. I mean... Uh, and and they are soft targets at the end of the day. They are the soft targets. So now that when you are permitting um, roads to be opened everywhere and people of all sorts and in disguise carrying out reconnaissance, there is a, uh, the chance of a strike increases. Let that not happen. Uh, let the uh, civilians realize that some inconvenience they should go to uh, uh, in the interest of uh, better security. After all, if there is a strike, and I'm sure if this kind of thing continues, opening of the roads, sooner or later there will be a strike. Uh, the morale of the security forces goes down because the officers and men who are serving in far-flung areas, so far they have accepted that our families are being taken care of, they are secure. Right. When that is not so, it affects their morale, which is not desired. Sure. As far as the question of excess lands mm -hmm. go, you know, these... All the lands held by the army units and cantonments and stations are based on a certain scale of requirement uh, for their installations, for their training areas and for other requirements. These scales have changed over the years and so as a result of reducing in the scale, some land is surplus. That land has been identified. Much of that land is useless. There is no road going through it. Mm, mm. These are not developed. Mm. This is because some of the buildings, installations and facilities are yet to come up, hmm. which are authorized. But they can be developed. They can be developed, yes. But there are certain areas, like when you acquire land, large number, a large area of land is acquired in which much of it may be unusable, hmm. particularly in hills and mountains, uh, even in some of the plain areas. So this surplus land issue is actually a different thing. And if we go more into it, at various times, some politicians have a, had an eye on the land in cantonments. Okay. 
So okay. that is a different issue. That's a different issue. Let's not get into that at the moment. Let's focus on the present issue at hand. Let me go across to Pankaj Sethi, who's been patiently listening to the other side of the argument thus far. You know, uh, Pankaj Sethi, what's the middle ground then? How do we strike a balance? Because even the other side has a has a very serious, uh, you know, claim to the problem itself. Security cannot be uh, brushed aside. It is a major concern. What's the middle path then? Frank, uh, <clears throat> see, one point we must realize, there is a difference between a pure military station and a cantonment. A cantonment, by, as I said, it's by definition uh, a mixture of civilian and uh, military populations. Whereas a pure military station like Patan Court or Kaluchak or Rudi, uh, I mean, these are, uh, no civilian uh, population is allowed inside, except for people who work there. That is point number one. So it is unfair to compare pure military stations with cantonments. It's, of course, another matter that, you know, we have been attacked even in pure military stations where no civilians are allowed entry. Now, the second point is that although it is true that uh, inside certain areas, inside cantonments, there are military families staying, it is also a fact that more than 90 percent of these families actually stay outside cantonments. I stay in a civilian area near the cantonment and... Uh, I mean, our, our surroundings are, uh, we, uh, there's a majority of uh, services population there, uh, including ex-servicemen, uh, serving servicemen, uh, including people who are posted out to the border and so on. Their children go to schools and colleges there uh, in, in, in the civilian areas. Uh, so, you know, uh, there is, uh, one, one, one must not uh, get into a, uh, I would say, almost an irrational uh, fear if, if the civilian families are safe, and in fact, if you look at Jawans, more than 90% of their families are in their villages or towns or, uh, and then staying with the rest of the civilian population. So, and the other major point I'd like to point out is that people are asking for access to the thoroughfares, to the roads. They, they are not interested. You know, there are roads. Uh, you don't stop uh, by the side of a road unless you have work. Now, if I'll give you an example in Sikandrabad, more than 25 roads are closed in an area stretching over 10 kilometers from Hakimpet to Maratpalli. So, even though what uh, Dr. Paliwal says and the General Saab says uh, is, is, you know, about inconvenience, the inconvenience is tremendous. And it is multiplied by almost 15 lakh population because, you know, the city of Hyderabad is divided into 19 municipal circles. Three of those are straight away right next to this 10 kilometer strip. Sure. Plus another six wards of the cantonment board. Right. So we are talking something like, uh, you know, more than 15, somewhere between 15 to 18 percent of the population of the city. Okay, points taken. So, and, and a similar thing exists in uh, people like... Uh, you know, b b before I before I hear out the professor and the general, let, let, let me bring in uh, Vivek once again. You know, some of these cantonments, many of them, in fact, are, are in existence from pre-independence. So, isn't it time for us to take a relook at some of these cantonments itself and, you know, how they function and what needs to be done in today's day and age, Vivek? Well, that's a um, great point. Again, it's something that I was hoping I'd be uh, able to ask as a question uh, in this panel right now because I think we have people who will be able to answer uh, really well. Again, we come from the perspective how to best manage cities. A lot of these cantonments, like you pointed out, may have existed at the peripheries of the cities to start out. Well, cities have grown around it, right? Now, not only can these uh, cantonments be looked at as, as strategic military uh, assets, but if you were to assume for a second that those didn't exist, these are strategic land parcels that can be uh, utilized for tremendous good in a city itself. Uh, again, estimates range from anywhere between uh, 5 lakh, uh, let's say, housing units, affordable housing units uh, can be made in just the excess land parcels that... Uh, cantonment boards hold in the country, right, which is, I mean, close to 20% of the housing requirements of the country can be taken care. Uh, if you, let's say, utilize these lands in a manner that is different from what it is being used for right now. So, in fact, I may not be best placed to answer that question, but given how strategic uh, some of the cans are, right, and I've lived in Bangalore for a very long time now, and Bangalore, again, has grown around certain cantonments. It's near Alsur, and a large portion of the city lives around it. So A majority of the city of Bangalore is, of course, mili uh, military-owned or cantonment area. So yes. that's the way it is. Yes. Now, if we were to take that, combine it with uh, the BBMP, let's say, and then develop a plan that includes those lands, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there'll be tremendous good that comes out of it. But is it possible for us to relocate large areas of the cantonment to other areas that's that's the question that i think okay closing comments now from this, all my guests starting this, starting with the with the general now yeah vivek i'm sorry this makes me angry 
for all the faults of the municipal civil authorities of a city, hmm. you want to now destroy the cantonments. Remember, although no longer relevant, cantonments started long back. They were selected areas where, which were far away from cities, primarily for housing military personnel and units. From the health point of view, you know, isolated from civilian population, not to say that there were no civilians. In all cantonments, there are civil lines, there are Sadar Bazaars, all of them. Yes. And those are the ones which supported the people living in the cantonment. Then the cantonment boards came in primarily to manage the cantonment, the municipal services inside the cantonment. Most of them uh, self-financed from taxes and non-tax revenues without any help from elsewhere. And they became islands of excellence and lungs for the city. Of course, by all means, people can settle around it. But when there is pressure to say that cantonments must be relocated is actually punishing them for the lack of development uh, of the cities. Hmm. So I think uh, we should not go into that. And now with opening up of cantonments, you gave the example of Bangalore. I think large number of roads in Bangalore are open. Right. Very few are closed. As you, If you compare the number of roads and the length of roads which are open with the length of roads which are closed. There are more roads that are there open are than, more roads than which closed. Are open. Yes. So it depends from cantonment to cantonment. You cannot generalize. Uh, well, Secunderabad also is a example which is peculiar to itself. Sure, I am sure something can be done. But you know, asking for all roads to be opened, cantonments to be relocated, okay. uh, you know, civil housing to be made inside cantonments on some surplus land, by all means, take the surplus land which is not used at the moment and give them alternate land. No problem at all. Okay, but points taken. I've got very limited time, okay. uh, General. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you short. I'm going to ask my uh, panelists to be brief. In 30 seconds, closing comments, starting with uh, Pankaj Sethi, please. Frank, uh, the only thing I'd like to say is that all these facts were considered by Honorable Raksha Mantri and uh, the Chief of Army Staff, General Rawat Saab. And uh, they have taken a considered decision. And uh, that considered decision, one must not forget that the Honorable uh, Minister Saab had called a meeting recently of uh, MPs from all 62 cantonments. Right. And uh, I mean, those recordings are available on uh, Facebook and YouTube and so on. You can see what is the level of inconvenience which is being faced by people. Okay. So, I mean, uh, it is you know, fine. The, I mean, security you can know, this be... this is a debate that is going to go on forever. Public inconvenience versus security. Uh, I think we, we do not have the time to, to take this any, 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 any further. But, uh, Professor, closing comments from you. Yes, um, I would like to just comment on, on that, that he was saying that, you know, Mr. Pankaj, that, you know, many army uh, people are living outside, officers who, are, who didn't get accommodation. That is why we didn't get accommodation inside the cantonment. So they are living. We are short of accommodation. Mm. And then to these lands also wants to be taken. So where do we, they relocate us? Outside the cities, where do we send our kids to school? Second thing is that if you see from the natural, uh, you know, nature's or pollution's point of view, mm. The, almost the entire city is polluted. It's only the cantonment areas where there is a less po pollution because that is controlled. And, and that's why the general public that wants access to That is why the general public, it. but once it is open to the public, do you think that the pollution level will go up or will it will go down? Okay. We, we see a lot of... You okay. Know, yes, Vivek. Yeah. Yeah, uh, again, the point is not... Um, so, specifically uh, to your point, uh, I, I was placing this question in front of you because uh, we grapple with how to seamlessly integrate cities and cantonment boards and urban villages around together, right? Because from the point of a citizen, they are engaged with how they can get seamless governance, right? A citizen may not be concerned with cant versus X versus Y versus Z. So from where I was coming from is that, is there a, is there a way where we can explore how seamless governance is provided? And mobility is just one of those small aspects. All right. On that note, then I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.